Welcome friends. It is time for our Sunday School Recap for January 10th, 2021. So we're returning to the Gospel of Mark, your faith in action. And what we're going to do is a recap, a review for chapters 1, 2, and 3 today. Yesterday's Sunday Silly. The lady at the furniture store told me, this sofa will fit five people without any problems. I said, where am I going to find five people without any problems? So we'll do a brief uh, prayer. Uh, we're going to skip our worship song today. Um, and like I said, it's a review and a catch up in the Gospel of Mark. So we're all ready to go in chapter three next week. Uh, summary statement for what we've learned so far. Jesus' ministry was characterized by divine authority, faithful preaching, and conflict with stubborn religious people. We're going to see that continue as we move forward. So let's have a word of prayer if you don't mind joining with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for another day to study your word, to have it transform our lives. Thank you for the work of your son, Jesus, and we pray that you would uh, bring about that transformation, that you would grow us in our faith, grow us in our service to you, grow your kingdom through us. May we learn, remember today what, what we've learned so far, rehearse some of that, and commit ourselves again to your service in your kingdom because of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're going to begin with Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Summary statement, Mark begins his gospel by describing the ministry of John the Baptist. Luke and Matthew begin their gospel with the birth of Jesus. John begins his gospel all the way at the beginning, beginning, uh, even before the beginning, when the Word was with God and the Word was God. But Mark begins with the account of John the Baptist and his ministry. Key verses are Mark chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, where it reads, quoting from the prophet Isaiah, uh, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So John came pre, um, preaching a baptism of repentance uh, and preparing the way for the Messiah. What can we learn from John's ministry? What practical application? Serve where God puts you, even if it's in the wilderness. John had a little bit of a peculiar ministry a ministry that was in the wilderness. And uh, I know a lot of colleagues that desired big time ministry in, in, in big church or big cities and big churches and big cities. Uh, sometimes God doesn't put you there. Sometimes God puts you in a rural place or in a wilderness, even in the desert like Mesquite. But there are streams of refreshing water in the desert. So serve where God puts you, even if it's in the wilderness. Moving on, verses 9 through 15, Jesus was baptized. Then he was tempted by the devil at the beginning of his ministry, and then he went forward preaching. Looking at verses 11 and then 14 and 15, after his baptism, he came up out of the water, and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Then verses 14, Jesus begins his ministry after his temptation. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Believe the good news. And like Jesus, it should be our ultimate goal in life to please God. We want to get to the end of our life, the beginning of eternal life. We cross that threshold. 
we stand before our maker and he says well done good and faithful servant we want to hear those words now we know we won't always be able to do that because we're still sinners we're still frail finite human beings so there's going to be times where we won't please god um, but we can strive toward that goal verses 16 through 20 jesus calls his first disciples we're going to focus in on verses 17 and 18 and jesus said to them follow me and i will make you become fishers of men and immediately they left their nets and followed him jesus begins to call to himself disciples who will learn from him and be with him and 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 pass on the ministry that he's beginning and when Jesus calls, we must follow him immediately. The disciples left their nets immediately. Uh, sacrificially, they left their nets. They left their businesses. They left their, their normal way of life and began to follow Jesus. And we must follow Jesus exclusively. We don't add Jesus to a whole other list of things that we like to do. Jesus isn't another hobby. He is God uh, his kingdom priorities eclipse everything else. Uh, so don't delay. Don't balk. Don't waver. Um, Jesus isn't just another God to follow. He deserves our full devotion and full um, submission and allegiance. Verses 21 through 28. In that episode, Jesus heals a demon-possessed man. One of the characterizing factors uh, of Jesus' ministry was the fact that he invaded the, the, the realm, the kingdom of, of Satan, if you will. We see that in these passages. We're going to focus in on verses 24, 25, and 26, where the unclean spirit cries out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. So the Bible teaches the uncomfortable reality of spiritual conflict. Despite uh, our Western, the prevailing Western view that those things are just primitive um, ignorant superstitions of ignorant men, primitive men. No, spiritual conflict is a reality. But another reality is, the greater reality is, Jesus is victorious over all the powers that oppose us. Verses 29 through 39, we see that Jesus' ministry was characterized by divine authority and gospel preaching. Verses 38, 39, Jesus said to them, let us go to unto the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out, preaching. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And as Jesus' disciples, we should prioritize like him, people, Jesus invested into people, not only those who he healed and those he preached to, but especially those 12 men that he invested his life in to train them for gospel ministry that they might pass on the torch of Christianity and on and so on and so forth down to down historical, um, down history to us. Prioritize people, prayer, and proclamation prayer often in the life of jesus we see him withdrawing for prayer particularly in the, the gospel of luke but we see that some in, in mark as well and proclamation preaching now when i say preaching it doesn't mean you have to be a preacher some of the best preaching is one-on-one -on -one conversations sitting on the front porch in a rocking chair sipping you know, root beer and telling your grandson about Christ 
and what he's done in your life, that's preaching, folks. So that's what's, what she, we should be about as gospel people. Verses 40 through 45, Jesus cleanses an impertinent leper. So we look at verses 41 and 42. This man, this leper comes to Jesus, imploring Jesus um, to heal him. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will or I am willing, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And just like Jesus traded places with the leper, Jesus traded places with us. With, through this encounter with the leper, Jesus became unclean when he touched the leper. Uh, he became an outcast uh, when he touched the leper. And we see more and more in the ministry because of this, in the ministry of Jesus, because of his overwhelming popularity um, and notoriety, he, he could no longer go into the cities and towns, but he was driven out into the wilderness or, or he, he, he had to stay out in the wilderness or else he was mobbed. Well, he became a leper for us. Uh, it's the same thing that he does, does for us theologically. We call that the substitutionary atonement, fancy words. What does it mean? It means that Jesus took our sin and gave us his righteousness. That great exchange on the cross where he took our sins upon himself, took the punishment we deserve for our sins on himself, so that we could have his righteousness, so that we could have his eternal reward, eternal life, eternal blessing, and, and relationship with the Father um, that we don't deserve. He did that for us, that great exchange. So, like the leper, we're spiritual lepers. And if you want to be clean and forgiven, implore the Savior. Come to the Savior bow at his feet, acknowledge him as Lord, and beg him, ask him to make you clean. That's the lesson there. Verses 1 through 12, chapter 2 now, chapter 2. In chapter 2, Jesus proves his authority to forgive sins by healing a paralytic. Great story. You may recall it. Uh, the four friends bring their paralytic buddy to Jesus. They can't get through the crowd, so they go up on the roof. They dig a hole through the roof, and they lower him down in front of Jesus. Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And when the Pharisees hear that, they look on Jesus with disdain and doubt and hatred. Uh, who is this man who claims to forgive sins? And Jesus says, so that you know I have the power to forgive sins, um, he heals the man. He says, rise, pick, take up your mat, and walk. Verses 10 and 11. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he did. Here's some applications for us from that story. Faith will make a way. These four friends had great faith. They knew that Jesus would heal their friend. They just had to get him to them, get him to Jesus. Faith will make a way. They went so far as to dig through the roof to lower their friend in front of Jesus. Now the flip side of that is doubt will block the way. Doubt is the enemy of faith. Um, the, the man who doubts is unstable in all his ways, James says. He shouldn't expect to receive anything from the Lord. And there in the corner were those doubting Pharisees, and they blocked the way. Uh, but Jesus will make a way for us to be forgiven. That's the story of Christ on the cross. He came to win our forgiveness. And again, if you want to be forgiven, if you want to be cleansed of your sins, simply ask Jesus. He has the authority to forgive your sins. Now, verses 13 through 17. Jesus calls Levi, a hated tax collector, to be one of his disciples. 
Verse 14 says, And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the text booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. Levi, also known as Matthew, who wrote the Gospel of Matthew, was a hated tax collector. He basically worked for the Roman government and he made his profit by exploiting his fellow Jews. Um, but he left that lifestyle to follow Christ. He left his wealth, he left his ability to make future wealth to follow Christ. And that tells me there's nothing we could leave behind that is more valuable than knowing Christ and advancing his kingdom. Another way to say that is being a Christian is costly, but worth it. It costs us something to be a Christian. Aspects of um, our lives that we have to give up. Time, financial resources, um, maybe dreams or, or goals that we had before we came to faith. Certainly it costs us uh, the pleasures of sin, if you will. You have to be willing to let go of those things in order to follow Christ. And Levi certainly did and was blessed for it. Verses 18 through 22. The Pharisees criticized Jesus because his disciples were not fasting. So everybody, the, the John the Baptist's disciples were fasting because he was in prison. At this point, he might have even been killed. Um, the Pharisees, they like to fast all the time. And all their disciples, they fast once a week and they made a big show of it. Well, here's Jesus' disciples, and they're not fasting, they're feasting, they're partying it up. Uh, and so that really got under the skin of the Pharisees and the scribes, the, your typical religious folks. So they questioned Jesus about it. Verses 19 and 20, Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guest fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. Jesus is the bridegroom. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He is the very Son of God, and the Pharisees missed it. If they would have recognized Jesus for who he was, they would have been feasting too. They would have been celebrating too, but instead they were all wrapped up in their religiosity. So as Christ followers, we need to know when to feast. That is, we need to know when to celebrate. Celebrate our relationship with God. Celebrate God's good to us. And we also need to know when to fast, when to mourn, uh, specifically over our sin, when we need to be grieved over um, behaviors or attitudes or, or things that displease God. There's a time for feasting. There's a time for fasting. And for Jesus and his disciples, it was a time of feasting, but he was going to be taken away from them, carried off, nailed to the cross, a time for mourning. So aren't you glad Jesus loves sinners like you and me? And isn't that a reason to celebrate? Verses 23 through 28, this conflict with the Pharisees begins to build. And here the Pharisees accuse Jesus and the disciples of breaking the Sabbath. What they were doing, they were walking uh, through Galilee and there were grain fields that they walked through and there were paths through those. Um, and it was permitted by the, the law that they could, uh, as they're walking by their neighbor's grain field, they couldn't harvest with a sickle and keep it in a bag or anything like that, but they could pluck gra grain off of the stalks and chew on it for a little you know, road snack, if you will. Uh, that was permitted. Well, the Pharisees saw Jesus and the disciples doing that on a Sunday, and oh, that's breaking the Sabbath. They're harvesting on the Sabbath. Well, what, G what was Jesus' response? Verse 27, Jesus, he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus is now our Sabbath rest. 
we find our rest, our New Testament, New Covenant rest and refreshment in the person and work of Jesus Christ, not in a specific day of the week. So that portion of the law has been set aside. Yet, there's an enduring principle that we should embrace. It's wise to schedule regular times for physical rest and worship. It's wise to make our Sabbath, it's not really a Sabbath, but it's wise to make Sunday kind of a new Sabbath, a day for family, a day for worship, a day for rest. If we're able to do that, we should make it a special day. And if not, like me, because I'm a pastor, I work on Sunday, I need to try to find a day of the week when I can do those things. Now, Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, story of the man with the withered hand, another um, hostile encounter with the scribes and Pharisees. In fact, Jesus provokes the Pharisees by healing a man on the Sabbath. We're going to look at verses 5 and 6. Uh, and he looked around at them, the Pharisees, with anger, grieved at the hardness of their hearts, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians, the followers of Herod, that political party, uh, against him, against Jesus, how to destroy him. And so this conflict with the scribes and Pharisees and religious authorities is escalating and it will continue to escalate until it puts Jesus on the cross. Jesus didn't back down from that wrestle, uh, that fight. In fact, he provoked it um, for the purpose of going to the cross. And it was all about his compassion, this, his compassion for this man with the withered hand, his compassion for us as lost sinners needing redemption. The compassion of Christ is free for us when we embrace it, but it was costly to him. It cost him his life on the cross, and he knew that ahead of time. And he didn't shy away. He pursued it. He provoked this, this fight with the Pharisees. And so we should remember that this conflict with the religious authorities ends in Jesus' death, and he willingly went to the cross for us. Hallelujah! What a Savior. <clears throat> Verses 7 through 12, Jesus' early ministry was also characterized by an oppressive popularity. Verses 9 and 10, and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. Um, so Jesus was so busy and so crowded by uh, his popularity with the common man that he could hardly find any rest or relief at all. Everywhere he went, he was swarmed. Um, and so what's the application? Uh, well, I tell you the application is always have a boat ready. Uh, always have a boat ready, getting ready to go fishing. Uh, that's what that. That's what I think. But here, here you go. Here's a here's a real application. Life gets busy. Take time to withdraw for personal retreats, prayer, and solitude. Even Jesus, the Son of God, regularly sought time alone with his Father, away from the hectic world. We'll see him withdrawing from the public, spending time with his disciples, spending time with his Father, um, and recharging for the next challenge, the next fight uh, in his ministry. Now verses 13 through 19, Jesus formally calls 12 men to become his disciples. Verses 13 through 15 is our focus there. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired and they came to him, and he appointed twelve, whom he named apostles, sent ones, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and to have authority to cast out demons. What is the application? 
people are his program for reaching the world. That, that is, Jesus invested in 12 men. Now, he did preach to crowds, big crowds. He did heal many regularly. He did that big-time ministry, if you will. But his most important ministry was the discipling of those 12 men, uh, his apostles, because they would pass on the torch. They and the immediate group of disciples, a hundred or so, um, they would pass on the torch of Christianity. They were the ones who would build the early church. They are the ones who passed it on to others, who passed it on to others, who've passed it on to us. So we always re need to remember that it's about people. It's easy to get wrapped up in big time ministry and and all kinds of uh, dreams and visions and 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 um, programs and, and buildings and money and finances and all those things, and those are all just tools. People are his program for reaching the world. Christianity has always been about one on one interacting, making disciples. Being a disciple is more about a relationship than knowledge or performance. Sure, there's, there's things we need to know and understand and be taught, um, and we need to teach others. And there are things we need to do. Um, but it's often put this way, Christianity is better caught than taught, meaning it's not just something you learn in a classroom. It's something you live. It's something that is lived out in front of you, and you experience it in your walk with Christ daily. So his disciples were called to be with him. That's relationship. And then to advance his kingdom. So that's about all we have uh, today for, for you. We're all ready for next week where we dive in to talk about Jesus and his family coming to um, get him because he's out of his mind. Simultaneously, you have the Pharisees uh, accusing him of being in league with the devil. Some interesting passages coming up, so, so be, be ready. Hope you're able to be in class with us physically. If not, please use this video series as a tool to grow your faith. Let's close with prayer. And as I say, I read it, but I mean it. Heavenly Father, thank you again for sending your Son, Jesus, to deal with our sin problem. Give us the courage and the faith to follow him closer every day. Just like you sent Jesus, he has sent us into a world that so badly needs to hear the message of salvation. Give us opportunity and faithfulness to share your word. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, friends. See you on the flip side next week.